today, a deep dive on supply chains. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and properties with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, supply chains are very much in vogue at the moment, and I've found somebody who is prepared to spend a bit of time talking about it from the inside. Hi, Scott. Great to have you with us. Hey, Martin. How are you, mate? Yeah, very good. And thanks for reaching out. I gather you've been a follower of the show for some little time and uh, you've got some really interesting insights to share with us. Yeah, that's exactly it, mate. Um, followed you for a good few years now, and uh, you know a lot of the videos that you're talking about. There's always the mention of supply chain and um, the challenges that are in the market at the moment. So I just thought I'd um, yeah have a discussion about it, maybe unpack that a little bit and uh, delve deeper into the uh, into the reasons why and um, you know why there is inflation and 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 what's going to mean for the Australian economy and global economies. Um, over the next well it's, it's been happening already but um as as it, as it as it keeps going through the next number of years yeah great now that's good and uh, look just introduce yourself yeah okay mate um so i worked in the the freight and logistics supply chain industry uh 20 odd plus years now and in australia we're managing a you know, hundred thousand containers a year uh do full end-to-end -end supply chain management uh whether it's air freight sea freight warehousing uh, pallet distribution, um, and yeah, so we've we, we I'd like to think we see recessions, or we and we also see challenges in the supply chains because we're at the the cold face of it before before maybe the mainstream media or, or um, you see anything on on the TV about it. So um, yeah, so hence hence having the chat with you guys today and um, just to sort of add some value around what that means when you say supply chain issues. Great. Well, that's tremendous. And, uh, you know, I've been watching these issues bubble up for quite a few years. This is not just uh, Ukraine created, right? This is something which has been going on for some time. I actually don't even think it was just COVID created, right? I think even before that, there were some, some issues. There. But let's go back to basics. When we talk about supply chains, what are we actually talking about? Yeah, well, with, as, as you mentioned before, mate, um, you know, when, when, we, when you look at supply chains and the way that the world's gone, particularly over sort of the last 20 years, a lot of the manufacturing of products has been outsourced to, you know, the Asia region where they're moving uh, a lot of products in, into manufacturing sites, let's concentrate, say, on China, uh, whereby they're, they're pulling different parts of, of let's say, a, a widget and they're then manufacturing it and then re-exporting it from China. Um, so when it's disrupted, uh, it causes a, what we call a bullwhip effect in the supply chain. So uh, yes, yes, COVID obviously has um, accelerated that in the last two years in the challenges that we've got. Um, but it's the movement of yeah, the movement of products uh, globally, uh, and then you know, as I said, with the with the manufacturing uh, shifting in, into the likes of Asia, um, once once one one part of the supply chain gets uh, disrupted it has a huge knock-on effect down down the chain so um that's a general snapshot of what what it is at the moment so we mm. the challenges we're facing as i said uh, earlier on mate was um you know we, we've seen 40 foot container prices let's pick china again because it's the major trading partner or it's the largest importer uh country that we have um you're talking you know 900 us dollars for freight in into australia two years ago um you know before christmas it, it was hitting upwards of 12 to fourteen thousand. so depending on what's in the container you've got to divide that out it's 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 it will have a knock-on effect um in terms of the costs of everything in the country um you know so i, I mean an example i've got I, i've i have a customer that's in the cement industry and um you know they're doing 60 20 foot a week of of concrete in from in from apac and uh their cost has gone from 900 us dollars a 20 foot up to five and a half thousand and they're having a lot of importers are having a huge challenge um over the last number of years in terms of their cost of goods sold so 99 percent of importers are having those difficult conversations now with their customers saying you know here's an increase whether it's 10 percent or whether it's 50 percent 
um, to cover the costs of the of the shipping. Um, and obviously that, that has to be added to the cost of the goods and then obviously the distribution of it and covering all your other costs in, in, in when you run a business, um, it, it will all add up. So uh, that's a huge challenge at the moment. We've also seen in the industry, um, you know, and, and again, it's not really well known, but all the stevedores in the country. So all the, when you drive past Port Botany or Brisbane Port, you'll see the big cranes that unlo unload the ships. They've all put their prices up. Traditionally, they used to do a small increase every year. They're now increasing costs every every three every three months, and they're not. It's not a two or three percent cost. They're adding 10, 15, 20 percent. Um, and then you've also got because of the shipping, because of the imbalance of trade and the imbalance of the containers. If you take Melbourne for example, there's all the ship or Sydney or well, most ports really. Perth also being hit hard. You, you've got. You've got not just the ports, but then you've got the operators that are off the port. Their yards are completely full of empty containers, and it's 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 a huge issue in the in the in the industry in terms of imbalance of cargo. Um, therefore, those guys are also increasing their costs. Um, uh, uh, you know, again, you, it might be thirty dollars a container, but if you're doing a lot of uh, imports. It's it all has a knock-on effect, and, and that's and that's coming on. Of course, obviously, fuel. Um, I mean, we all seen that, but you know, traditionally, you know, fuel was ten percent. It's it's hitting thirty percent increases. So, again, it just knocks. It just has a complete knock-on effect all the way down the supply chain. And and when you look at the the inflation uh, level today at five point one, I mean. Yeah, I think that's uh, the, the reality is probably more like nine or ten percent. Um, I mean, the Americans are at nine percent now, but when you look at the figures, they don't count some things in it, uh, <laughs> as you know, as you know, yes. as you well know, Martin. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, it, it's a challenge. So let me just um, pull this apart a bit, right? So so the first thing to, to I think we should highlight is that supply chain is an, is a complex network, right, with many moving parts and many interconnected uh, relationships spanning the globe, right? And this is part of the globalization of trade that's happened over the last, what, 50, 80, 100 years or so. Um, but also, if you think about how um, elements are now built, like, pair of trainers for example you know they'll be pulling materials in from all over the world from different uh, manufacturers of, of those raw materials they'll then actually you know bring all that material into another third country you know, somewhere in china or something they'll be manufactured there they'll be processed there they'll be packaged there and then they'll have to be distributed you know elsewhere around the world so it seems to me you've got huge complexity You've got huge distances being travelled and you've got this idea also, which was also very much in vogue, of just in time, right? So you don't want to hold a whole amount of inventory because inventory costs. So therefore, what you want to do is just get your delivery of your raw components just in time so that then you can manufacture it and, sh and ship it, right? Yeah. And in a way, I think underlying what you've been saying, all of those assumptions about just in time and about these uh, long supply chains working well are, are under question at the moment. Yeah, 100%, mate. It's... Um in the perfect world, before this all kicked off, you, you could, um, the big corps were very, very good at managing their just-in-time, um, holding just enough infantry, uh, managing, uh, managing their costs with either the airline or the shipping companies, um, going to tender regularly. Um, and yeah, the, 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 and when you look at the shipping lines, for example, over the last 20 years, they've, they've very much made no money. Um, and a lot of a lot of the shipping lines actually, uh, there was a couple that actually went out of business um, because of the because of the, uh, the the challenges they had in terms of maximising their payloads. Anything anything that floats these days, it will make money, you know. So it's it's completely switched, um, and yeah. So that that's really what the, the the shift has been. And when you mentioned like the, the just in time that that. That used to work very well, and and that's that's more around that bullwhip effect, as I said, because since COVID, what a lot of people have, what a lot of importers have done, and it's not just Australia, it's globally, they've, I wouldn't say the words panicked, but they're they're pre-ordering to ensure that they've got cargo, and that that's happened over the last sort of year and a half. So they're they're over-ordering product, um, and then it's moving on ships arriving in into say sydney and then 
hence hence why when you look at the commercial real estate market in in most of the cities um every warehouse is full because they're, they're it's it's full of it's full of um product that people are, are pre-ordering and um hedging their bets that they that they're going to have issues as we go forward and that that's why that bull whip effect uh occurs you know so um it, it's and there's more challenges coming because there's with the shanghai issue at the moment that is going to cause a hell of a lot of pain in australia in terms of managing uh managing your orders managing this managing your supply chain very tightly um because yeah that that's going to have that same effect um as as what happened earlier in earlier in the uh in the pandemic uh with with that with the whole uh ordering process so yeah there's some some challenging times ahead i guess uh so so lead, lead times will be will be extended right um, you know the, the the maps of thousands and thousands of ships off shanghai, <laughs> off shanghai yes. at the moment just underscore it and it's interesting because if you go back a few months there there were huge queues of of ships outside uh, la ports right but right. They, they sort yeah. of shifted the problem back to back to china now uh, and the but the other point you you made i think is really interesting is this imbalance between ingoing and outgoing right because it used to be the case that you were able to you know take your raw materials in containers one way and then bring finished goods back and so that the uh, containers were actually relatively full both ways Correct. But because of all of these disruptions, um, my understanding is that some of those uh, containers now are going around the world empty because they've got no ability to be able to actually, you know, go both ways. Another reason why the costs are rising and the, the, the times are extending. Yeah, that's correct, man. It's um, we call it in we call it in our industry uh, when you look at the when you look at the sea freight side of things, it's called the a vessel emitting. So um, maybe I look at it as a I'm I'm in Brisbane. I'll give you an example on the Brisbane when we had the floods up here. Um, the port was shut for a week. Now again, that's another another knock on effect. So uh, what what actually was occurring was that the, the big shipping lines coming down the east coast always will stop in Brisbane. Sydney and Melbourne, or they'll go Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, depending on the um, on the schedule. But um, because they shut the port for a, sort of a week, ten days, um, the vessels, what they the, the the carriers would call it emitting, so they wouldn't actually stop in Brisbane to unload containers um, and also maybe pick up empties. So they would they would have to sail by Brisbane and stop in Sydney, Melbourne, and then drop drop all the all the containers in those ports and that obviously then has another knock-on effect because you know for brisbane exporters I have, a, I have a customer that does a lot of export um we we have an imbalance of of containers in brisbane because they're all sitting down in 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 melbourne and sydney and the um, it, it's the costs to, to rail or truck them are uh, it, it doesn't make financial sense so they have to wait for the next vessel to come along pick up those empties and then run them back back up to brisbane so that's that's and that's happening globally so when you look at shanghai there's going to be a hell of a lot of vessels that will emit um they'll, they'll head south to southeast asia to to unload um or to pick up and and again that's just has that continual knock-on effect so um ye yes you know it's been two years since COVID, but in the logistics supply chain world we don't see it settling down at for a Oh, at least till next year sometime and who and who knows and who knows what's going to happen then yeah and that's the point isn't it this isn't going to get fixed anytime quickly uh, i mean I, biden did a few things over in the us to sort of try and uh, you know keep the forts open a bit longer and encourage people to move stuff around but that really didn't touch the sides in terms of the these strategic issues and, and i guess the longer it goes on the cost consequences um, are compounding because it puts pressure right the way through the supply chain. It puts pressure on all the manufacturers and all the um, producers as well as the retailers. Uh, and, 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 you know, the way I think about it is it's a series of compounding problems. And the longer it goes on, the more complex it is to unpick. Um, and I guess the question in my mind is, are we ever going to get back to where we were, you know, in the pre-COVID days? Do you think it will settle down ultimately? Or are we seeing a, a fundamental shift in, in the thinking about the way that international trade works? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't think the shipping lines will ever go back to losing money or offering, you know, sub 1000 US dollar crazy pricing. I think that those days are definitely gone in terms of the costs. Um, it, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of conjecture at the moment about what actually, uh, where it will go in the future. If you look, 
some people are saying, okay, let's take, you know, take Australia and, and maybe America as an example with interest rates rising. Um, what, what extra money do people have to spend? And it's going to have a knock on effect there because um, it could be a stage next year where the volumes coming into Australia actually become are reduced because a lot of the consumer consumables that we're buying um, all come out of Asia those volumes may suddenly drop off, um, which would then lead to ships being less pressure in terms of being full, um, and would, which then will bring prices down with the shipping lines. But um, so th there's two ways. It'll continue as it is, which is a lot of disruption, but if it does slow down in terms of the volumes in, um, we, may see some, we may see some extra space available and we may also see um, some the cost of containers coming into the country reduced, but um, I mean, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> Pretty long, probably. <laughs> and, and look, the other interesting observation is that, uh, of course, we've seen, we saw those inflation um, numbers yesterday, and they were very, very strong. And of course, there's a very strong discussion now about well, central banks have got to lift interest rates. But I guess the interesting question is, that if a lot of these costs are actually directly created by supply chain disruptions. I'm not sure in my own mind how raising interest rates is going to actually make any difference to those supply chain disruptions. It's, so maybe trying to pull the inflation, uh, the interest lever to tackle inflation when the cause is actually supply chain disruption suggests that rising interest rates isn't going to help much. Yeah, that's, I suppose that's the, um, that's the big question, isn't it? But uh, it, it it's gonna, yeah. I mean, when you look at um, when you look at the supply chain, the costs are going to definitely keep rising. As you said, what what if, you know, if, if the interest rates are at ten percent, you know, so so be it. But uh, the 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 cost to move products globally will will I think still remain high, yep. um, and the. Uh, the you're not going to, for example, you're not you're not going to get a stevedore at a port turn around and say, "Oh, we'll we'll, we'll reduce our costs, or we'll, we'll drop our we'll co drop our costs." Once the prices are in, they, they're not they don't go down. Um, so, it, and with with the likes of the, the ports, etc., they're they're very much a monopoly, and you you've no choice to go anywhere else. So, um, yeah, we 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 will see, but um, the supply chain isn't going to go. Uh, the the costs that drive inflation aren't going to reduce anytime soon. That's for sure. Mm. Well, that suggests then that the Reserve Bank, if it lifts rates, may not, may not see what it, it hopes to see. And I guess there's one other question which, which, which intrigues me a little bit is, with all the pressure on, on the shipping lines themselves, um, how are they reacting? I mean, you, you said that some of them are now starting to make money where they weren't previously, but are they also looking to reduce costs, you know, cut maintenance, cut staff, um, all of that stuff to try and actually uh, control costs as well? Yeah, it's... Um the, the shipping lines, as I said, anything that floats is making a lot of is making a lot of money for them now. I mean, uh, I've got we can maybe look at it another time, but I've got I've got some slides there where it shows it shows the amount of actual money that the shipping lines have, have made over the last two years, and and you know the graph is literally just goes like that. Um, so uh, it's 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 actually scary, but yeah, the the what not so much the airlines, but the shipping lines are definite are definitely. Um, they're, they're, and it's been happening in the last five years, but what, what has happened is a consolidation of shipping lines. So you've got the likes of the, the biggest, the two biggest shipping lines in the world are Maersk and MSC, um, followed closely by uh, CMA and then yeah, various others. But Maersk has been very aggressive over the last number of years in terms of buying up their competition. So they recently, they read of was about a year and a half ago bought a, a shipping line called Hamburg Sud. Um, so what they're doing is they they're they're consolidating uh, vessels. Um, they're consolidating their their operations in terms of staff, um, you know, and they're also going very digital now. So whereas in the past you would pick up a telephone, email a person that was a real person to make bookings to get cargo on ships. Now it's very much, uh, you know, you go onto their website um, and, and you, you book everything through there. So 
Um, yeah, they, they are making uh, hay while the sun's shining. There's no doubt about that, and also and also going down the digital road where they're they're shedding staff and um, yeah, going going down the the whole the whole path of uh, online. So, um, but they're very cute as well. I mean, you, you should just they're you know traditionally in the past uh, as a freight forwarder for our larger accounts we would negotiate with shipping lines let's take an account that might be doing 10,000 containers into the country um, traditionally we would sit with them um, and we would we would say look we want a set rate at a fixed cost for a set period and it was very much clockwork and the rates we we as freight forwarders we were able to negotiate very very competitive prices because we had very good volumes um, because of the sh because the ships are now full, uh, and that's not just in or out of Australia; it's it's a it's a global thing. Um, the shipping lines are now turning around and saying, "Well, we we will give you five five thousand of the ten. We will give you that fixed rate, and we will give you um, you know set allocation, uh, which which means space on a vessel, and they guarantee it over a certain period." They're now turning around and saying, well, of the other five, um, you can go onto our portal and book there. And instead of a rate being, I don't know, 2,000 that you lock in at the, at the 10, they're locking in instead of two now, it's, it's six. And they say the other 5,000, you go on and you book on, on what we call the, the spot market. Um, and, you know, the, the rates are double. So... Uh, that's that's been a huge shift um, in the market over the last sort of year and a half um, because the the carriers, as I said, they they've never been as aggressive. They're making a lot of money, and they don't they don't they're not uh, they're not entertaining any uh, anything that's that's not making them a lot of money, whether it's an allocation or a uh, or or an FA, we call it an F, a freight of all kinds or an FAK booking. Uh, spot market booking uh, with them. So there's a huge amount of disruption and that that also has put a lot of um, challenge in our industry um, for staff because we've had the amount of work now that needs to be done to manage the supply chain has, has exponentially grown. Um, uh, so the, the company I work for, we're very we're very good at IT and managing KPIs, and we have a very we have a global operations platform, but um, we, we're still finding it difficult. And every and every freight forwarder in the market is having huge challenges to get to get staff. Um, I guess when you leave school, you don't say I'm going to work in the freight forwarding industry. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those industries where it sort of goes unheard of. Mm. Um, but yeah, we're, I mean, like a lot of industries, I think with the whole with this whole pandemic, you know, if you're in the airline industry or the travel industry, you, you probably lost your job. If you're in the freight forwarding industry or other, or other industries, the the pressure on your job has just gone like that because the the demand is is huge and the and the and the management of the supply chain has, uh, you know, caught you know, delivered huge challenges for 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 the industry that I work in. Absolutely. Well, last question. I'm just trying to get um, a quantum. You know, it's hard to know how many. What's what's a rough estimate of, of how many containers will come into Australia on a you know a month or an annual basis? I mean, we're talking a large number. Yeah. I mean, look, some of the vessels that are coming down out of Asia, you're talking um, you know four to five thousand TEU. Then you've got some other ones that are the very large uh, ships. That there was one recently that docked in in Sydney, Melbourne, because uh, it, it, it was upwards of 10,000 TEU. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, these vessels are coming in every week. Uh, so it's um, the, the, numbers of, the numbers are very large, to be honest. Uh, we've, we, the, the trade imbalance, we, we're lucky as a country in terms of, well, and particularly in the last year, um, with all the rain that we had, the, the export of, of fresh produce and of um you know the wheats the barleys the legumes etc have all exploded um so that that's also added to it because um there's not enough equipment coming in 
to, to rebalance the export going out. So, I mean, the, the point is that most people won't understand just how big the industry is, how many containers and, and container movements there are, and how complex these, you know, it's like a huge machine. It's, like, it's a huge global machine, right, with millions right. and millions of, of moving parts. And yep. I guess the takeout for me from all of this is that, you know, anybody who says, oh, the supply chain issues will get fixed next month, right? They're kidding themselves. This is, we, we are locked into a higher cost environment for quite some time into the future. And there probably will never be, um, you know, the same economics as there were previously. That means that inflation is going to be driven by a lot of this for a long time into the future. Yeah, correct. I mean, as I said to you before, mate, I was, um, I was saying to friends in that about a year and a half ago that the, the inflation freight train is coming uh, like you wouldn't believe, because we we started to see it way back then. Um, so yeah, I don't. Uh, you know, when when people mention supply chain, and th- I mean, there's two sides to it. I mean, some people are saying that it's going to drop off off a cliff next year, and then it'll all go back to normal. Other people are saying no, it's here to stay. It's going to take you know five years minimum before we. And and what is and is normal still normal? I mean, we'll probably we all forget about what it was like pre prior prior to. Uh, Prior to COVID, where you know the importers of this country would place a booking with their with their suppliers in whatever country it was coming from, they knew that it was uh, if it was out of China, the lead time was twenty five days. It was they'd place the order, it, it would be ready. You'd make a booking, it would get on the ship within a week, and it'd be down here in in sort of four weeks. And uh, you know you 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 unpack your container, you put it into a distribution network, and it gets delivered to the customer. Um, that that whole that whole nice world that we used to live in is definitely um definitely been disrupted and yeah who knows the future but um it's uh it, it's it, in my opinion it's probably it's here to stay it's here to stay for a while because um as i said the shanghai thing has only just started and that's going to have another knock-on effect so yeah interesting times ahead mate well i appreciate your 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 insight to scott very fascinating conversation thanks very much and i might come and pick your brains again for another show a bit down the track because sounds like you've got some interesting data and some interesting slides to share as well but uh, thanks for t- taking the time today to uh, speak to our audience no worries mate thanks for your thanks for your time also and um yeah good luck thanks see you later see you mate